Well, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you, and Lord, just the spectacular colors of the trees right now, thank you for the beautiful pictures we have in our minds of these things. Lord, you've painted a, a masterpiece, and we, again, just love it. We just pray tonight, Lord, another picture you're going to paint for us here in Genesis chapter 22. And Lord, may we take it to heart. May we understand just your love for us as we go through this chapter. Uh, just minister to our hearts. And Father, as always, as we worship, we love you and we want to honor you through these songs. We thank you, Lord, and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And in our last study, we saw Abraham and Abimelech make a covenant regarding a well in the land. And from there, we saw the birth of Isaac, the son of promise. And then we saw a separation or a departure of Hagar and Ishmael because the son of the promise and the son of the flesh can't live together and the whole point that Paul brings out in Galatians is law and grace cannot coexist together. Now, according to many Jewish scholars, they believe that some 30 years have passed from the end of Genesis chapter 21 to the opening of Genesis chapter 22. And I think they were correct. And, you know, we don't know what happened during those 30 years. They're silent years. And I think it was those years God was helping Abraham's faith to grow. To mature. So much so that we'll see tonight Abraham, knowing the promise that God had given him, is going to obey the Lord and do something that is the most, probably the hardest thing ever to, for anyone to ask you to do. And it's really a growth in Abraham's faith as he's really climbing the mountain of faith here in Genesis chapter 22. I think it, he reaches the summit here. Let me share this story with you regarding faith. Television interviewer and journalist Larry King describes three farmers who gather daily in a field during a horrible drought. The men are down on their knees, looking upward and praying the skies will open and pour forth a much-needed rain. Unfortunately, the heavens are silent, and the petitioners become discouraged, but they continue to meet every morning to lift up their request to God. One morning, an uninvited stranger approaches and asks the men what they're doing. And they responded, we're praying for rain. Well, the newcomer looks at each of them and shakes his head. No, I don't think so. Well, the first farmer says, of course we're praying. We're down on our knees pleading for rain. Look around, see the drought. We haven't had rain in more than a year. Well, the outsider continues to nod his head and advises them their efforts will never work. The second farmer jumps in and says, we need the rain. We aren't asking only for ourselves, but our families and our livestock. Well, the man listens, nods, and says he still isn't impressed. You're wasting your time, he says. Well, the third farmer can't take it anymore, and in his anger, he says, okay, what would you do if you were in our shoes? And the visitor says, do you really want to know? And the three landowners answered, we really want to know. The future of our farmland is at stake. And the guest announces, I would have brought an umbrella. <laughs> ah, there you go. True faith not only believes, but then acts upon that belief. And we'll see that in our study this evening. It's a powerful story that's going to be played out really down the road by another father and son. Very interesting tonight. So let's pick up Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now think about this for a minute. Abraham and Sarah, life has been really good to them. God's been good to them. Maybe, like I said, 30 years have passed. God blessed them with a son named Isaac. Everything is beautiful for years. And then we see God is testing Abraham. Now, I don't know about you. When I was in school, I hated tests. And surprise tests, I hated even more. And it wasn't because the teachers didn't instruct me what I needed for the test. It's just that I didn't listen. I didn't pay attention. So I always was in trouble. And I wasn't ready. 
But Abraham, over these years, I believe, was learning. He was growing. His faith was growing. But this test is going to surpass all the tests that he's ever had. Anyone that really could ever imagine a test to be. And keep in mind, this was not a test for God. This was a test for Abraham, to show Abraham where he was at in trusting what the Lord said. And it's not really a test to produce faith or grow faith, but to reveal how he was doing. You know, Spurgeon put it like this. He said, I cannot imagine a greater test than that which the Lord applied to Abraham. The Jews usually say that Abraham was tried 10 times. Surely on this occasion, he was tried 10 times in one. Yeah. You know, we face difficult times in our own lives. You know, things are going well, right? And you go, oh, man, finally, I could take a deep breath. Everything is going good. And then all of a sudden, something happens. It's like, where did that come from? Well, that's Abraham here. I mean, he had 30 years where it seemed like everything was okay. We don't know for sure. You know, God uses those things in our life to show us where our faith is at, to help us to learn to trust in him more. And what he tells Abraham is to take his only son Isaac to Moriah, a specific mountain that he's picked out. Now, wait a minute. How many sons did Abraham have? Two. He had Ishmael, right? And he had Isaac. But God doesn't even recognize the son of the flesh. He only recognizes the son of faith. He doesn't even mention Ishmael's name. And I think the Lord does that in our lives. He does not acknowledge our sin or boast about our sin, just as he showed here with Abraham. And God instructs Abraham to take Isaac and offer him as a burnt sacrifice, and the Lord will specifically guide him to the spot that was located on Mount Moriah where this is going to take place. And I think, you know, you read that and go, are you kidding me? How could God do something like that? I remember years ago, President Obama mocked this portion of Scripture and what God was doing here. But he didn't really read the whole story and see what this was all about. But can you imagine God instructing you to do something like that? And let me be clear on this. God is not going to instruct you to do something like this. God is not going to instruct you to take your son and offer him as a sacrifice. Okay, this was specific for Abraham, and it was showing a picture of what was going to pl take place some 2,000 years down the road. It's been fulfilled, and God's not going to instruct people to do that anymore. And as we'll see, he didn't really, Abraham did not sacrifice Isaac. Again, it's a picture, and we'll talk about that. Now, several years back, there was a columnist for the L.A. Times who was discussing this incident in the Bible with his readers. And he said that if God told him to do something like that, he would have told God to mind his own business. That's the response of the world. But as Christians, you know, God tells us to do things. We need to obey. You know, does God tell us to do difficult things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can only tell you from my own experience as a Christian. There's been a lot of things that God has instructed me to do that have been very difficult. You know, one of them was a hard one to come even up here from Chicago to Manitowoc. I knew absolutely no one, not one person here in Manitowoc. But I knew what God called me to do, and I needed to take that step of faith. He's told me specifically that I needed to talk with certain people. Difficult to do, but I needed to do it. And, you know, if we act like, you know what, God, mind your own business. We would never say it that way because we're too spiritual to put it in that. With those words, we would be more spiritual about it. But why won't we do it? Because we don't trust the Lord. You know, we're not, wa able, we're not walking by faith. And again, God is not going to instruct us to do something like this today. God was using this again for a specific purpose. I want to be very clear on that. But what, let's, let's put that in our time frame today. What if God speaks to your son or daughter and tells them that they are to be missionaries in Africa or Iran or um, the Jordan or wherever? 
would you let him go? You know, my son, a few months back, went to a country that was very hostile towards Christians. Was I nervous about him going? Yeah, I mean, he's my son. Did I tell him not to go? Absolutely not, because I knew that he was praying about it and this is where God wanted him to go. And seeing what, how God used that time to minister to those people who were Muslims was amazing that he was even able to talk with them. So yeah, what if God tells you to go somewhere that's dangerous? Would you go? You know, for me, I went to Haiti, dangerous area. I went to Russia. Everyone was, you know, people were worried about me. Why are you going there? A big war is going to break out. Well, it did break out, but, you know, I knew what God called me to do. And when God puts it upon your heart, then it's a, a walk of faith. Okay, I know what you've told me, Lord. I know what I need to do. Now I need to take those steps and do it. You see, wherever the Lord calls you to go, whatever he calls you to do, that's the safest place to be. The most dangerous place to be is outside of his will. Now, in this verse is the first mention of the word love in the scriptures. And what is it associated with? It's associated with a father's love for his son and the sacrificial offering of that son. Does that sound familiar? Well, let me give you a hint. In John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God so loved the world he gave. Same thing what's going on here with Abraham. They're acting out what God the Father and God the Son would do some 2,000 years down the road on that very spot on Mount Moriah. We call it Calvary. In fact, the Hebrew word that's translated offer is Allah, A-L-A-W. And the word means to lift up. And I think that's interesting because wasn't Jesus lifted up on the cross of Calvary? And here Abraham is told to lift up his son on Mount Moriah. Wow. And again, that's a pretty big request that God gave to Abraham. He waited 25 years to have a son with Sarah. And now says, okay, go offer him as a sacrifice. Your only son, the one you love. How do you think he's going to respond to that? Well, we don't even have to guess because look at verse 3 here in Genesis 22. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. What amazes me is that there's not the slightest bit of hesitation on the part of Abraham. You know, he didn't tell the Lord, can I pray about it? <laughs> he just went and did it. The next morning he gets up, gets the wood for the sacrifice, gets two of his men and the sacrifice, Isaac, and they journey out to Moriah. And for, from Beersheba to Moriah is about 50 miles. It's going to take them three days to get there. Now, do you think Abraham understood all that was going on here? Absolutely not. But he trusted in the Lord and his promises to him, and so he walked by faith. You know, we want to know everything about God. We want to know everything about our lives, the situations, what's going to happen. But like the Lord said in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, can we trust the Lord? Can we trust in his promise to us? We may not understand all the details, and we probably won't, but we are to trust in him. You know, Paul in, in Hebrews chapter 11 wrote about this incident with Abraham and Isaac. In verses 17 through 19 in Hebrews 11, he wrote, By faith, when Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. In other words, what Abraham is basically saying is, look, if God wants me to sacrifice Isaac, 
then it's okay, but then he's going to have to work out the details for giving him his descendants. Isaac doesn't have any children yet, and yet through his seed. So something's going to have to happen. In fact, maybe God's going to have to raise him from the dead. Well, that's a pretty remarkable statement of faith on the part of Abraham here. You know, Spurgeon said there's not a word of argument, not one solitary question that even looks like hesitation. God is God, he seems to say, and it's not for me to ask him why or seek a reason for his bidding. He has said it, I will do it. Wow. When God calls us, are we willing to step forward and do what he wants us to do? Abraham's doing it. Look at verse 4 here in Genesis 22. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. In Genesis 22.5, we see the first use of the word worship in the scriptures, shakal in Hebrew, and it's associated with sacrifice. When we think of worship, we tend to think of joyful praise, but obviously that's not what's going on here. The word means to bow down or prostrate oneself. Paul in Romans 12, 1 said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. See, worshiping the Lord speaks of giving him our life to be placed on that altar of sacrifice for his use. The problem with living sacrifices is we keep getting off the altar and running away. But we're supposed to, Lord, here's my life. Use it as you see fit. And it's only Abraham and Isaac that are going to go up on the mountain. He tells these two men who are accompanying them, Look, we're going to come back down, both of us. Wait a minute. Abraham's going up there to do what? He's going up there to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, a burnt offering. So how are they both going to come down? Well, there's faith. God's going to have to do something to fix this problem. He didn't know how, but he trusted in the Lord. Remember what God said in in Genesis 21, 12. To Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman, talking about Ishmael. Whatever Sarah said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. So Isaac's going to have to have children, right? So God's going to have to do something to spare this man. It was God's problem. And Abraham believed God was going to be able to do it. He was more than able to bring it to pass. Now, some of you may be thinking that I'm stretching this idea that Abraham believed that God would have have to raise Isaac from the dead. I'm not. Remember what we read in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. That's what Abraham believed, that God was going to have to raise Isaac, or Isaac from the uh, dead if he did sacrifice him. And there's no one who was raised from the dead at this point in the Bible. Also, And I think our Sunday school programs tend to fall prey to this. You see that word lad, and, you know, then you've got your Sunday school pictures where, you know, Isaac is this little boy. He's maybe 8 years old, 10 years old. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, You know, it could speak of someone who is 30 years old, still called a lad. I believe he's 33 years old. Why? Because I think Jesus was 33 years old um, when he was crucified. And I'll explain that in a little bit here. So when Isaac calls his dad, hey, dad, where's the sacrifice? We've got all the wood. We got all this stuff here. Where's the sacrifice? 
And it says, God will provide himself. Now, in most of your Bibles, it said, God will provide for himself. That shouldn't be in there. You see, a lot of that stuff becomes confusing. In other words, God is going to provide himself as a sacrifice. And it's exactly what happened some 2,000 years down the road. Remember when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, what does he say? Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This is the sacrificial lamb. A coincidence? That's not kosher, guys. God was allowing Abraham to act out what would take place, kind of the sneak preview of what another father would do in the sacrifice of his only begotten son. And again, I believe Isaac was the same age as Jesus to fit the type, to fit the picture, 33 years old. And Isaac carried the wood just as Jesus carried the cross. Look at verse 9 here in Genesis 22. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Keep in mind the age difference between them. Isaac could have over overpowered his dad, but he didn't. What did he do? He laid down his life willingly as a sacrifice. You know, when my kids were young, when they were 10 years old, I could overpower them. Now I don't even go down that route <laughs> anymore because they could overpower me. They're bigger and stronger and younger than me, a lot younger than me. And so... Um, that was Isaac. He was younger, stronger. He could have overpowered his dad. You're the sacrifice, Isaac. Get down on that wood. Hey, I'm not doing it, Dad. But he did. He willingly laid down his life on that wood just as Jesus would do as he freely gave his life and laid down on the, that wooden cross. Well, look at verse 10. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went out, went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. How in the world was Abraham able to go through with this or attempt to go through this? It's incredible. And it's all because he trusted the Lord and his promise to him. That's the only reason. He knew that God would have to raise Isaac from the dead. And that's how close he was from offering his son. And the angel of the Lord steps in. I believe it's the pre-incarnate Christ. And he speaks to Abraham and tells him to stop, not to go through with it. You pass the test. And really, that's the ultimate demonstration of love. Love and obedience to the Lord, or faith in action, you might say. Well, why was a ram offered instead of a lamb? Maybe because God is showing us that the promise is not going to be fulfilled until Jesus fulfills it. You know, Peter said in Acts 4.12, Nor is there salvation in any, in any other, um, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. And what does Abraham call the place? Hey, I passed the test? No. I mean, we might brag about that. Or Agony Hill, because, yeah, it was bad. Or I did it. No. Yahweh Yaira. The Lord will provide. Yahweh speaks of the all-sufficient one. He's the great I am. Not I was or will be. He's the great I am. He's what, anything we need him to be in our life. He's Yahweh. And so in the mountain of the Lord, he provided a sacrifice for Abraham. And he's going to provide himself as a sacrifice 2,000 years down the road, as I said. And Moses tells us here that this Mount Moriah is still called Yahweh Yireh in his day. 
because it's here that the Lord has provided atonement for our sins. On this very mountain, Abraham and Isaac are acting this out for us. And in the Old Testament, there are a lot of names of God because he meets us where we are. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. El Eloing, the Most High God. Yahweh Nissi, the Lord my banner. Yahweh Ra, the Lord my shepherd. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord that heals. Yahweh Shama, the Lord is there. Yahweh Tesidkanu, the Lord our righteousness. Yahweh Mechodiskam, I believe is how you say it, the Lord who sanctifies you. Yahweh Yaira, like we said, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. And Yahweh Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. See, that's the amazing thing about our God. It doesn't matter where you're at, what you're going through. The Lord will meet us with exactly what we need. That's how much he loves us. And then we need to listen and obey him. We're going to deal more with this in a minute. I'm going to kind of give you a, a little bit of a summary of how this all plays out. And it's an amazing story again. We'll cover it a little bit, but hang in there. Look at verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and I have not withheld your son, your only son. In blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in, all your, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So God is not only going to bless Abraham and his descendants, but all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through them. How could that be? Because what we read this evening in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, from the seed of the woman, from the descendants of Abraham, from the nation of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah would come and has come. And all the nations of the world can be blessed if they receive him. Now, you know, some read what is spoken of here in Genesis 22, 18, that this seed is speaking of Israel, the Jewish people. Not at all. Why do I say that? Because it says, in your seed. It doesn't say seeds. It's not plural. And Paul even picked up on that in Galatians 3.16. He says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So Paul explains it to us. Okay, this is not seeds. This is speaking of the Messiah. It's speaking of Jesus. It's singular. Now, Look at verse 19 again. Who came down from the mountain? Well, it says, so Abraham returned to his young men. Where's Isaac? It doesn't say, does it? Did Isaac come down with Abraham? I believe he did. Then why don't we read of that? I think the Holy Spirit is setting this out for us for a specific reason, and I'm going to deal with that in a few minutes because... When you see this story, you will realize that it is God who inspired these scriptures and not written just by a man, not at all. Look at verse 20. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn, Buzz, Huz and Buzz, I don't know, his brother, Camul, the father of Aram, uh, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, uh, Jedlap, and Bethul. And Bethul begat Rebekah. These eight Melka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was uh, Rima, also bore Teba, Gam, uh, Thash, and Maka. Why is this lineage even mentioned here? To make me mess up the names, I think. That's, no, there's another reason. The girl named Rebecca is going to become the wife of Isaac. So that's the reason we're told of this genealogy. Now, 
I actually was going to move into Je Genesis chapter 23 this evening, but I want to take some time and look at this picture that the Lord is painting for us here. Because Abraham is giving us, again, a sneak preview of the coming attraction. And we'll see that as we go through this story even more. Amazing picture. You know, David said in Psalm 40, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. In other words, the Lord is saying, when you look at this from Genesis to Revelation, it's written about Jesus and these Old Testament pictures and types of Jesus are in here to point us to our Savior. You know, if you read the Bible, you don't see Jesus. You're not reading the Bible. You're not looking because he's throughout the scriptures. Remember when Jesus was speaking to the Jewish religious leaders in John 5, verses 39 through 40. He said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But it is they that speak or testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. See, it was, it, the scriptures are all about Jesus, and they refuse to come to him. They refuse to see what the Bible is saying about him. Also in John 8, verses 56 through 59, as Jesus is speaking to the Jewish religious leaders, again, he tells them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the, then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Again, when Jesus said, I am, he is saying, I am the voice from the burning bush in, Genesis, in Exodus chapter 3. I am Almighty God. And that's why the Jews took up stones to stone him, because he, being a man, made himself equal with God, and they refused to accept that even though the scriptures testify of that. There's another interesting point here. When Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. When did Abraham see this day? This day of salvation that Jesus is speaking of, this good news, the gospel message. I think it's here in, in Genesis chapter 22. As Abraham and Isaac again are acting out the gospel message 2,000 years beforehand. Now, you may be thinking it's far fetched, but listen closely to how the Holy Spirit paints this picture for us. Point number one we see that Abraham is told in Genesis 22 2 that he should take now your son, your only son. Like I said, he had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was the son of the flesh, Isaac was the son of promise. And so God didn't even acknowledge the son of the flesh. And he wants Abraham to take his only son. Wow. Isaac. Now, here's the thing. In a sense, God has two sons. Think about this for a minute. First was Adam, right? God created Adam. But because of his sin, the human race was contaminated with sin and death. So he's a son of the flesh, you might say. Not recognized to bring about salvation. Adam couldn't bring about salvation. The other son is Jesus, or God becoming flesh dwelling amongst, among us. And that's what we see, John 3.16. God so loved the, the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? See, Abraham is a type of God the Father willing to sacrifice his only son to shed his blood so that sin may be covered just as God the Father was willing to sacrifice his son to shed his blood so that the sins of the world may be forgiven. In fact, the Bible says our sins are going to be ca are cast as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. So his only son. Point number two, again in Genesis 22.2, it's going to take place in the land of Moriah, or Mount Moriah. God instructed Abraham where this was to take place, on a specific mountain, not just anywhere he wanted. And Mount Moriah, on this range of mountains, is where the temple would stand one day. Across from the temple on the same range is a place we know as Calvary, or Golgotha, the place of the skull. 
And I believe God instructed Abraham to take Isaac to this place where Jesus would be crucified some 2,000 years later. When we were in Israel, we went to Golgotha, to Calvary. And it's interesting because the garden tomb is just, from looking at the skull and the rock, the garden tomb is just down this way. Calvary is up this way. It's up on a hill. Down below today is a bus stop. People pass by not even realizing all that took place some 2,000 years ago. But on that rock, and the reason it's called Calvary or Golgotha, the place of the skull, is because in this rock is a picture of a skull. You see it cut out into the rock. Now it's falling apart a little bit now, but you could still see it. When we were there, it was very clear. So it's interesting because God is orchestrating all these events, right? And Moriah means foreseen of Yahweh. Why foreseen of Yahweh? Because God knew where and when this would take place. So he says, Abraham, I want you to do this. I want you to act this out. Abraham didn't know he was acting it out. But God wanted him to do this to give us the picture. The third point is that Isaac was to be offered there as a burnt offering in Genesis 22 too. And like I said, the word offer, Allah, speaks of lifting up. Lift up Isaac as a sacrifice. In John 12, 32, Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Mm, interesting. Amplified Bible puts that verse, And I, if and when I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, will draw and attract all men, Gentiles as well as Jews, to myself. So just as Isaac was going to be lifted up as a sacrifice, Jesus is going to be literally lifted up as he was crucified on the cross of Calvary. The fourth point is that this was a three-day journey. We see it in Genesis 22.4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. It took him three days to get there. Now, how does that relate to Jesus and what he's done? I believe that Abraham started out on this journey, and in his mind, Isaac was already dead. He was, Abraham was going to do this. The, it was, he got up early in the morning and went. And in his mind, Isaac was dead man walking, basically. And on the third day, what happened? The life of Isaac was spared, or that Isaac was raised up, you might say, on the third day. Interesting. How long was Jesus in the tomb? Three days and three nights, right? Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's exactly what transpired. Jesus rose from the grave on the third day that Sunday morning. The fifth point, again, is found in Genesis 22, 6. We see that Isaac carried the wood for this sacrifice. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. I don't know, man, you think I'm offering my son as a sacrifice. Maybe I'll just carry the wood for him, right? Give him a break. But no, he puts the wood on Isaac to carry. And it should remind us of what Jesus did. He carried the cross of wood to the place he was going to be crucified. Again, John 19, verses 12 through 18. From then on, Pilate sought, sought to release him, release Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. So, as Isaac carried the wood upon his shoulders to the place where he was going to be sacrificed, 
the Lord carried the cross, or the cross beam, really, to Calvary. The sixth point is that the judgment of God is in the Father's hand, as Abraham had all the implements for the sacrifice of his son. <clears throat> We're told in Genesis 22, 6, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. So as they traveled up to Mount Moriah, Abraham took the fire that speaks of judgment in the scriptures and the knife, which obviously speaks of the execution of judgment and of sacrifice. And again, it's a picture of what God the Father would do, pouring out the wrath of God upon who? Upon Jesus. That was for us, but he took that for us. He bore the sins of the world. The seventh point in Genesis 22.8 we see God will provide himself as the sacrifice. And like I said, that verse, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Wow. You know, it, it, it's kind of humorous as you know the story and you look at this and, you know, Isaac tells his dad, hey, dad, I, we got all the wood and all this stuff. Where's the sacrifice? You know, what is he going to say? And it's interesting what he does say. He doesn't say, Isaac, you're the one. He says, my son, God's going to provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Wow. He's going to provide himself. In fact, the word for, like I said, was added. It, it shouldn't be there. God is going to provide himself as the lamb. Again, John the Baptist, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God's provided himself as the sacrifice. In fact, Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7, we see how the Messiah is spoken of. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He took our sins and bore them on the cross of Calvary as the sacrificial lamb. In Revelation 5.6, that's how Jesus is portrayed once again. But the sacrifice is completed. It says, And I looked, John looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. I find that fascinating to me. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is bearing the marks of the crucifixion. We're going to get new bodies. Will he still have those marks? It seems like it. It seems like it. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And God provided himself as that sacrifice for our sins once and for all. Peter, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. The eighth point is Isaac freely laid down his life. Genesis 22, verses 9 and 10. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Again, Isaac was probably 33 years old at this point, And he, like Jesus, freely laid down his life. He could have got up and left. He could have overpowered his dad. He could have done whatever he wanted, but he laid down his life freely. And that's what Jesus did. In John 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. The ninth point, Isaac laid on the wood, Genesis 22, 9, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And we understand that one. Jesus was placed on a wooden cross. He laid down upon it, was nailed to it. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Yeah, that's what God has done for us. And again, you know, God never intended Abraham to sacrifice his son. But again, was showing Abraham his faith, how it had grown. And to illustrate for us, to paint a picture for us of what another father was going to do by sacrificing his only begotten son. You know, the angel of the Lord, or Jesus, prevents him from going through with this. And Abraham sees again this ram that's stuck in the thistle and offers him as a sacrifice instead. And I think, the, again, the idea is Jesus is the Lamb of God. There is no other. And for us, we can try all kinds of good, you know, good works, this or that. You know, I go to church, I do this, I do that. No. What did we read? It's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that has come to take away the sins of the world that we are saved. Now, the tenth and last point is in Genesis twenty-two nineteen, And this is the one I didn't touch really on at all. But Abraham came down from the mountain. It says that. So Abraham returned to his young men. Where's Isaac? Where did he go? I truly believe Isaac was with Abraham. There's no doubt. I don't think Isaac took a hike. Of course he went with his dad. They went back to Beersheba. Then what's the point? Well, I think, again, the Holy Spirit is editing this to fit the picture, to paint the picture for us. Abraham is a picture of God the Father. Isaac is a picture of God the Son. But we haven't had the Holy Spirit, have we? Where's the Holy Spirit in all this pictures, these pictures? Well, I'll show you. In Genesis chapter 24, Sarah's died. And Abraham's old. Isaac is still not married, not yet. So Abraham sends his servant. His name is Eliezer, according to Genesis 15, 2. And he wants Eliezer to go and find a wife for Isaac. And he tells him to go alone. You're not to take Isaac with you. So Eliezer finds Rebekah and brings her back. And the next time we see Isaac in the scriptures is when he meets his bride, Rebekah. Well, okay, what's my point? How does that fit the picture of Christ? When Jesus died and rose on the third day after he was taken up into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father, the Father sent the Holy Spirit into the world to work. Now, interestingly enough, the word used for Holy Spirit can mean comforter. You know what Eliezer means? Comforter. What a coincidence. No, again, it's not a kosher word. We can't use that. So just as Eliezer went out to look for a bride for Isaac, what is the Holy Spirit doing? The Holy Spirit is in this world drawing out a bride for who? For Jesus. The church is the bride. And when that last person gets saved, the Lord comes back for his bride, the church, and we're gathered to meet the Lord, our bridegroom in the air, and then the judgment comes, the tribulation period comes. Jesus does not return to the earth for his bride because the next time he comes to the earth, it's for judgment. Again, he meets us in the air. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit edits this out. We don't, again, see Isaac until he meets his bride here in the scriptures. Is he there? Well, of course he is. But we don't see him again until he meets his bride. And we don't see Jesus again until when? We meet him, our bridegroom. So the picture is completed. We have Abraham as a type of God the Father, Isaac as a type of God the Son, and Eliezer as a type of God the Holy Spirit. What a picture, again, that's painted for us 2,000 years before the events even took place. It's like reading... Psalm 22, 
where it's a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross a thousand years before that event took place. Wow. Right here in Genesis, Abraham saw this day and rejoiced. He saw the gospel message played out. You know, there's a story about Bob Woods. He tells this, actually, he tells the story of a couple who took their 11 uh, year old son and uh, seven year old daughter uh, to Carlsbad Caverns. And, you know, they reach the deepest point in the cavern with the tour guide, and they get down there, and you know how it is in these cave tours. They turn off all the lights. They warn you, but they turn off all the lights to show how completely dark and silent it is below the Earth's surface. And the little girl suddenly, you know, enveloped in this utter darkness, was frightened. She began to cry. And immediately was heard the voice of her brother, Don't cry! Don't cry! Somebody here knows how to turn on the lights! Yeah, <laughs> that's the message of the gospel, right? Light is available. Even when darkness seems overwhelming, God has turned on the light. You know, that whole gospel message, Paul brings it down in, into just a few verses in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Exactly. And the thing is, have you trusted in the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world? That's the most important question. And for us that have, we should be rejoicing. You know, it, I know I say this, but you know, every time I go through a new book in the Bible, I go, oh, this is my favorite book, and I've done it 66 times, right? Even Obadiah, that's a great book. There's still great stuff in there. Even Leviticus, you know, some of you are going, man, Leviticus, when is that coming up? It will, you know, we got a few books to go before that. They're all great books, why? Because the Holy Spirit opens them up to us. And this is one of the most amazing messages. When you see how this is played out, and you go and you look at this, how this happens in the New Testament, you go, how could that be? Because God knows the beginning from the end. Lou Wallace set out to study the life of Christ one day, and he wasn't a Christian. And in fact, writing a story such as Ben Hur was the farthest thing from his mind. He, had, he was not going to write that something like that. He was against Christianity, determined he would study the life of Christ so thoroughly, and then so write so convincingly that he would destroy the story of Christ. Many have tried to do that. He wanted to prove that Jesus, if he lived, was not God, but merely a man, that he never rose from the dead, and Christianity was a hoax. And he studied and studied, and he was overwhelmed with the evidence. And he dropped to his knees and cried out to Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. And instead of writing a book to prove to the world that Jesus was not God, you know what he did? He wrote Ben-Hur to prove to the world that Jesus was God. Really, I, I've never read Ben-Hur. I'm kind of intrigued to read it now. Not the movie, but probably the book, because I don't know how the movie plays out with the book. People can try and destroy the Bible, the Word of God. They can try and take Christ out. They'll never be able to do it, because he's God. He's God. And it's always interesting to me, guys. Look at how the world, other religions how they come against Christianity. Look at how, what swear words, what they're used. It's always about Christ, right? You don't say, ever say, you know, hit your thumb and go, oh, Buddha, you know, uh, or whatever. Why? Because they're trying to come against the truth. You don't fight against something that's not true. You fight against the truth, and that's exactly what we see. And for us, man, our hearts and lives should be so overwhelmed with such joy and love for our Lord and Savior.
because what he has done for us is just the most amazing thing in the world. And I am so thankful for this portion of scripture, for all the scriptures. But this is just such a beautiful picture that you just could not write this from human efforts. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit and played out 2,000 years down the road. What a loving God we have. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word this evening, and this picture is amazing. And there's so many amazing pictures in the scriptures of you. And it's just taking the time and being patient and searching the scriptures and seeing what you have for us. This amazing story. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm so thankful you didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn us because we're already condemned. We didn't need more condemnation. We needed a Savior. We needed Jesus, the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace and mercy. And may we glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.